In our continuing conference interview series at the Cryptocurrency Conference in Atlanta, Georgia, I'm joined by Kathy Reisenwitz. Until recently, she was a digital publishing specialist at Reason Magazine, and now you're an associate at YoungVoicesAdvocates.com. I'm not actually familiar with that organization. Can you tell me what you do there? Thank you so much for having me on, Adam. So Young Voices is an outfit where we try to connect young people, so young professionals and college students, with the mainstream media to get their views represented in the news. Does that work? It's been working pretty well so far. Um, we're in talks with Al Jazeera right now, Al Jazeera America. Um, we just got one of our advocates published in The Advocate, so that was pretty exciting. And we're plugging away. That's really cool. Al Jazeera has been sort of an interesting thing. I, you know, they they reached out to me too. It seems like they're a lot more open to these to these alternative viewpoints than than a lot of uh, the the domestic media is. Kathy, you've been a libertarian activist since university, but you now live and work in D.C. When you first began your career in activism and education, did you see a revolution likely to happen in money? And Basically, what I'm asking is, did you see something like Bitcoin even as a possibility? When I was in college and first getting into liberty, I definitely saw a revolution happening with money because I remember the passion around monetary policy that the Ron Paul candidacy created. Uh, kids were really motivated by the message of, end the Fed, um, stop the, the slow erosion of wealth and savings, um, especially for young people who were dealing with uh, graduating into lots of debt and not lots of jobs. They were very concerned about how they were going to be able to build prosperity for themselves going forward. I did not at that time see cryptocurrency on the horizon as any kind of solution to that. It was very in the Fed, gold standard, you know, change the way our government deals with money. But this is far more exciting to go around the government and deal with the problem of some money ourselves. It's really an interesting idea to be able to denationalize money. Jeff Fong recently wrote about that for Let's Talk Bitcoin. And the idea that, you know, I mean, and Jeffrey Tucker spoke about it yesterday too, you know, that Hayek looking forward, you know, predicted actually that this is something that could happen, but he couldn't predict how it would happen because the technology simply didn't exist. So it's been really interesting to see cryptography kind of come into the mainstream and really be able to pick up on, on these various ways. It seems like when you're in the minority of, I don't know if I want to say the culture, I don't know what it is about libertarianism that seems to be, I mean, it's certainly a growing movement, but we're still definitely a minority within, within the space. And so you kind of have to think outside the box. You kind of have to you know, look for other solutions. Do you think that, that you know, Bitcoin is the start of a trend of alternative solutions, or do you think that, that it's hard to do this? I think that Bitcoin is part of the general trend toward how the market solves problems. So one of my favorite quotes is by Henry Ford, and he said, if I'd asked people what they wanted, they would have said a faster horse. And what that means to me is no central planner, no individual could possibly predict what the market will provide to solve the problems that it's allowed to solve. And so I think cryptocurrency is an absolutely perfect example of there's a problem of unsound money. Nobody could have predicted that this is where we are in solving that problem. And no one can possibly predict where we'll be in a few years towards solving that problem and what that solution will look like. So many, many libertarian supporters are supporters of hard money. And yet Bitcoin is this really controversial thing in a lot of libertarian circles, even though it seems like there's this natural proclivity towards it once you understand it. Do you think that this is a problem with comprehending it and being just generally skeptical about new things? Uh, because, I mean, again, you, you, look at the, you look at our current monetary system and compared to the hard money system, it is a very new system. So innovation is not necessarily good. So I think that the difference between a focus on sound money and a focus on alternatives um, has to do with, are you focused on the problem of the state or the solution of the market? And I think that we need both. We need people who are focused on how government is messing up our money supply and, and what can be done to make that better. But ultimately, uh, that's not going to be the solution. The government, we just need to get it out of the way. And what will ultimately succeed is, is going to be, I think, alternative currencies. But I also think that it's kind of a, a difference of risk, levels of risk aversion. I think people who are a little more risk averse are going to be more interested in making sure that the government offers a gold-backed currency and people who are a little more into high reward are not as focused on that and want to just get around to that and um, get in early on alternatives.
the idea that either at an individual level or at a country level, you know, at a nation state level, you could see a cryptocurrency based standard either with cryptocurrency being used as the currency or with cryptocurrency being used to back a currency in much the same way that a gold standard would back a currency. Except that it doesn't have a lot of the problems that a gold standard does. It doesn't have the transparency issues where, you know, it has to be hidden in order to be protected. There, there are kind of two questions here. Do you think that, first off, something like this can be allowed in the world that we live in? And secondly, do you think that in the world that we might inhabit in the future, do you think that something like this can happen on a nation state level? Or does removing the power from, from the political structure, is, is, that, is that anathema to the structure? So I don't know if this is going to answer your question completely, but um, feel free to follow up. I ask hard questions. <laughs> well, something that I've been thinking about for a while is um, how the nation state will, will look in the future. And I think that one thing that's going to be extremely uh, world-changing is going to be the continued irrelevance of geography to economies. Um, so what I mean by that is it's, it's not going to matter where people are as far as how they do business, who they do business with, uh, you know, where their customers are. None of that's going to matter because it's all going to be online and we're all going to be connected through that. And so as that becomes true, competition for where you're going to set up your business, so the laws that you have to live under, uh, is going to increase, right? So like, for example, um, I'm an entrepreneur and I want to start a business. You know, only I need to live in this place because all of my workers can live wherever they want to and all my customers can live wherever they want to. And so um, I think as competition between nation states or you know entities that provide property rights increases then you're going to have uh, competing monetary systems and competing systems of law which is going to be amazing for freedom you know we already basically have that <laughs> i live in california the company that uh, let's talk bitcoin is formed in is based out of california but i think that i'm the only person in California who actually you know draws any sort of any sort of compensation from it and everybody else is either in a different country or we have a we have an editor who lives in Michigan where you know the cost of living is a quarter the cost of living in California so I definitely can see that you know it seems like a lot of the problems that we have in society are based around the idea that the people who make decisions aren't actually responsible for the actions that their decisions incur. And it seems like to a certain extent, Bitcoin can actually help us with that by further removing the power from, from, the, from the people so that they don't have to be responsible, but at the same time, they don't have the control. I guess that's the thing that I keep coming back to is that you don't necessarily have to have control, but if you have control, responsibility seems like it has to be baked into the cake. And that's not the system that we live in now. Absolutely. I think that's absolutely true. And that's kind of part of the point that I was trying to make with my talk is that governments are experimenting with currencies, but somehow they're not taking responsibility for the experiments gone awry. And that's what's so beautiful about cryptocurrencies is that everyone who participates is responsible for how it all shakes out. They can't put that on anybody else. They can't force it on anybody else. It's urine. You do what you need to do. You see what happens. So uh, speaking of your talk, at the conference you gave a talk called Why a Free Society Needs a Free Money. For those who weren't able to attend, can you kind of give us your argument in a nutshell? Sure. So my talk was, was basically making the point that drawing an analogy between what everyone who's playing with Bitcoin is doing is they're participating in an experiment. So uh, what that means is they, we, nobody knew how Bitcoin was going to shake out, whether it was going to work, that it was going to work this well. Um, but they got in and they tried it and they saw what happened and they shared what happened. And through that, we've learned an incredible amount about cryptocurrencies, about online currencies. Some of the questions that I asked that Bitcoin's answered is, uh, can you provide transparency but still be trustworthy? Um, can an algorithm limit inflation? Can wildly fluctuating value make it unusable? These are all incredibly valuable things to know, which we found out. And I was making the case also that uh, governments also experiment with currencies. So the Weimar Republic, Chile, Zimbabwe, uh, all instances of hyperinflation, all experiments gone awry. But then on the softer end, you have the experiment with the euro, which we're seeing how that's worked out with the uh, money grab in Cyprus and the riots in Greece. 
Um, and then in America, we have our experiment with an expansionary monetary policy that's causing a long, slow erosion of wealth and savings. So understanding monetary policy and currencies as experiments, it's obviously much, much better to allow individuals to experiment, to benefit from what they're learning, to limit the risk to only the people who are voluntarily experimenting than it is to force entire countries to participate in experiments where the consequences of an experiment gone awry are uh, wide and 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 forced upon people. So, but isn't that, I mean, like we in, here in America, we have the Obamacare argument continuing to go on. I think we're in year two or three of it now. A big point that, it, that has become pivotal is that everyone has to participate, and even if you don't participate, you have to pay in, because lacking that, the system doesn't work. Isn't that just as true with currencies? I mean, like, if people were allowed to voluntary, voluntarily pick currencies, doesn't that mean that they wouldn't use the bad ones issued by governments? That's exactly what that would mean. <laughs> okay. So, but I mean, but, I mean, the thing that I always get, get back to is, is how do we get from here to there? You know, I mean, like, there, there's obviously so much potential here. There's so much that could be done. But the people who have the ability to do it have none of the incentives that make them want to do it. And the system doesn't, doesn't you know, hold them responsible for anything like we were talking about. So how do you get from here to there? Well, what I exhorted uh, Bitcoin enthusiasts to do is to not just experiment, but also to join me in the fight for the freedom to do so. So the first thing that we can do is just fight back against all um, seizures and encroachments on our tools of experimentation. Uh, the Silk Road um, seizure of more Bitcoins than have ever been seized before, things like that. We need to, uh, to, to protest those things and say, you know, um, just, you know, setting aside monetary policy, you know, just let us experiment. Just let us have our money so that we can find out what we need to find out about it. And then if it works, let it grow. And if it doesn't, let it fail. But just let it happen. Right. Well, this is the argument I think that libertarians have been making about the market now for about, very, very vocally for about five years. And it's getting even more vocal as we continue to go down this rabbit hole and nothing seems to be being fixed, even though we keep doing the same thing. Um, You know, talking about the Silk Road, you know, yes, there's an element of experimentation there. But also, I mean, it was a, a market where you trade illegal items. And so, you know, wrong or right, those are illegal items. But at the same time, it brings up an interesting parallel because the Silk Road did not create a market. The Silk Road serviced a market that, that already existed that simply didn't have a good way of, of conducting commerce online. And, and that, that conducting of commerce online actually seems like it has advantages in illegal markets because it limits the contact between people, for better or worse. So Silk Road solved the problem of violence in the drug trade. It didn't limit contact, but it did move that contact online. And so instead of broken kneecaps, you had bad user reviews. Instead of armed robbery, you had bitcoins not being released until the goods arrived. And so this idea that we're going to shut down Silk Road to protect people is absolutely ludicrous. This was protecting people. This was solving that problem. And uh, I just can't believe that they would they would shut it down. Well, you know, I mean, at the same time, though, you look at what's happened recently with marijuana policy, and there was recently a ruling passed that said, I don't remember if this was a state or federal, that said that dispenser, I think this might have just been California, actually, that said that dispensaries um, were no longer allowed to hire armored car companies, (laughs) right? So they're no longer allowed to use armored cars to transport funds. So, I mean, it seems like the government doesn't want to protect certain types of people and actually is, is just okay with them, you know, having problems. Well, it would seem like they would want to shut down the solutions to preventing violence in the drug trade, which is, that needs to give you pause about their true desire to protect people from violence. Yeah. (laughs) One of the kind of uh, recurring topics is Bitcoin or cryptocurrency, because a lot of people think that Bitcoin is cryptocurrency. In other cryptocurrencies, they're basically, you know, like experiments and the U.S. dollar, you know, in much the same way that Bitcoin is an experiment relative to the U.S. dollar, which, which I think it sort of downplays any potential impact that they might have. I'm wondering, what do you think is the innovation here? Do you think that it's Bitcoin or that it's cryptocurrency as a class? I think it's cryptocurrency as a class, but I wouldn't want to downplay the importance of the first most successful right. cryptocurrency. Right. But I think ultimately, innovation don't stop. 
Like, this is the beginning. So, Kathy, you're also the editor-in-chief of Sex in the State, which is a website where you write about the topics of sex and power. Your writing has also appeared on a number of other libertarian and libertarian-leaning sites. If someone would like to, to get in touch with you or, or see your work, where can they find you? Thank you so much for having me, Adam. I really enjoyed it. So um, check out Young Voices Advocates at youngvoicesadvocates.com. Um, I'm on Twitter at, at Kathy Reisenwitz, C-A-T-H-Y-R-E-I-S-E-N-W-I-T-Z. You can also find me on Facebook at facebook.com slash Kathy Reisenwitz. And um, please read my blog, sexinthestate.com. We look forward to catching up with you at the next conference. DNS is the Swiss army knife for your domain names, helping meet their customers' individual needs since 1998. EasyDNS has been an outspoken critic of SOPA and CISPA. EasyDNS was an early supporter of Bitcoin, and now they are proud to sponsor this show. Do business with a company that shares your values. Get a 13% discount when you pay with Bitcoin. Go to bitcoin.easydns.com and be sure to use discount code LTB.